Sorry, Unip, have we started yet? Not yet. You know, it's been such an exciting day, so much incredible information. I would just like to take a moment to meditate first. Yeah, OK, but have we started yet? Not quite yet. I, I really appreciate the enthusiasm, but I'd just like a moment to meditate first. How about now? Have we started yet? Not quite yet. How about now? Have yeah, let's do it. OK. Let's get started. Awesome. So I'm, I'm Jeff Posnick. I'm a member of the developer relations team working on the YouTube API. And I'm Yaniv Inbar. I'm a technical lead in the Google API infrastructure team. And today we're going to be talking about YouTube API push notifications. And um, people might be familiar with the fact that asking the same question over and over again is annoying, whether it's two presenters on stage or whether it's your web application talking to Google servers. So um, I'm sure it's tons of people over in code that pretty much does this. Anything new? No. Anything new? No. Anything new? Yes. Awesome. But anything new? No. OK. So this is, this is the polling uh, paradigm of, of writing code with your web applications trying to figure out whether something's happened either in the YouTube world or any of the other Google APIs out there. And um, polling is bad. And we, we want people to say no to polling and kind of change their way of writing applications. Uh, one of the problems with polling is it's really hard to find the right interval to poll. Um, you could say, let's poll every hour where we ask the server whether anything's new. And there are problems with that. Um, you might receive your events late. Um, you know, there could be up to 59 minutes between, in between the time something happens and when you find out about it, and you know, about 30 minutes on average for any event. So you really don't have instant feedback. And you may miss events. Um, you know, if you have a really long poll interval, there could be like three different things that happened to a resource in between that interval, and maybe you know, the final state didn't change, so you can't really detect it once you do get around to polling. Um, so you're losing some data there. So you know, the next reaction that people have is, OK, well, let's poll every minute. Let's poll kind of at the other end of the spectrum. And you know, that's not great. You end up wasting network bandwidth. In, in that case, you're sending a lot of extra requests. Um, you might actually also run into quota issues. Uh, as uh, we're well aware, many of the a Google's APIs and YouTube APIs are um, also in that category, have quota associated with them. And you want to make your API calls count. So you don't want to just have calls that are asking the same thing and getting back to no response again and again. So uh, what can people do instead? And uh, we're happy to say you can now say yes to push notifications. And the whole model behind push notifications is that instead of my web application asking Google whether something's changed, you know, Google says, hey, guess what? I've got something new for you, Jeff. Uh, that's, that's very nice of Google to tell me when something is new. Because you know, Google and the YouTube APIs, we know when things have happened. So we could tell interested parties, hey, something's changed. Um, benefits hopefully are obvious. You uh, have lower network bandwidth that's used, lower quota consumption, um, almost immediate notifications when something's changed. So it's a much better user experience overall. And I mean, honestly, it's a much better developer experience. Nobody really likes writing while loops that are just running in the background. Um, so we have a much nicer experience overall. And I'm going to hand things over to Yuniv to talk about the life of a notification channel. That's a really great explanation of the problem that we tried to solve. So I'm on the Google API infrastructure team, and we built a protocol, which we're calling notification channels, not to be confused with, say, YouTube channels. It's a totally different thing. Um, and I'll talk in detail about how the protocol works, give you a good conceptual overview of the life of a notification channel. And what I'll be talking about today is webhook notifications. This is a common technique that's actually used on the web. Um, you'll see where a website registers an endpoint where they can receive callbacks. And we're going to be using webhook to receive register your application's notification endpoint, where you'll be receiving callbacks every time something changed. So let's take a look. The first thing you do whenever using YouTube API, if you've ever built a, a web application that uses the YouTube API, is you have to register your application. And if you've ever done that, you might be familiar with this already. We've renamed it the Google Cloud Console, and this is a new URL. And the first thing you do is you want to enable the YouTube data API. You want to accept the terms of service. You'll want to register your application, give the name of your application, set up the consent screen, 
that uh, is shown to your users, as well as define what platform your application is running on. For, in this case, it's going to be a web application, but we also support mobile applications or native applications that are installed on desktop devices. And finally, and the reason why I showed you a bunch of details here, is that we're soon going to enable a requirement that you register the domain where you're going to be receiving notification endpoints. The reason we do that is we want to make sure that you actually own that domain. If you're running on one of Google, uh, Google's cloud platforms, say an app engine or a compute engine, we already know whether you own that domain. But if it's another domain, you'll need to register your endpoint domain. So I'm gonna be talking about OAuth 2 here because it's central to using the YouTube API whenever you're making requests. And there are a variety of different flows um, that, YouTube, that OAuth 2 um, um, supports. And it's a standard protocol on the web. This literally is now a final standard. So you'll see it in a lot of uh, different services use it. And I'll demonstrate here one type of flow, which is where a user owns uh, the data. And the key thing about YouTube, uh, sorry, OAuth 2 is that it is intended for a, an, a client application to access protected resources. So how does Google know that it's okay to access the user's data? Well, we start here, that's a picture of me. That's supposed to be the user. And uh, God, I think that picture needs a little bit of enhancement. Maybe take out some of the wrinkles. <laughs> Skin glow. <laughs> All right, so uh, what, is, what happens when the user goes to your web app? Well, it goes to the web app, says, I'd like to use your application. So the web app goes to Google and says, is it okay to start, uh, please start the authorization process. So Google uh, asks the user, is it okay to grant access to this web application? And when the user grants access, you get an access token. And this is a really key, because anytime you're going to be accessing the user protected resources, you'll want to use that access token. And I'll show you that, how that works in, in detail a little bit later. And in this case, we're, because this is a sample of how a, a, notific, a notification channel works, the web app is going to ask the user which collection uh, we'd like, uh, the user would like the web app to, to listen for. So I'm using the word collection. It might sound a little bit abstract. Think of a YouTube playlist. That's a good example of a collection. But the reason I chose the word collection and not just a YouTube playlist is because we built this as, as, a, as a protocol, and you'll be able to use the exact same protocol, say, with Google Cloud Storage API, we just recently announced that they support push notifications. And maybe there'll be other uh, Google APIs that support push notifications in the future. So you'll be able to re uh, refer to this presentation in the future as well. So let's take a look at the start of watching uh, for changes on that collection. The web app makes a request to, the, to Google. Uh, it's calling the items.watch request. And uh, Jeff will later show you an example of how to use our client libraries to make this really simple. And Google will say, OK, it's all right. Um, we'll give you, um, we'll, we'll, we started that uh, notification channel. And you can see there's all the collection there that, uh, that we're going to reference when we call items.watch. And it's owned by the user. There's two items in there already. And at the same time, the notifications endpoint, which is running in that same domain that you registered earlier, will receive a, what's called a sync notification. This is the, an opportunity for the notifications endpoint to then go to Google and say, give me the current state of that collection. So whenever I receive notifications in the future, I'll know what's changed. I'll be able to figure that out. So think of this as a chance to synchronize your web application with Google. And when you're done with that, just return on 200 OK. Everything went fine. Now let's go into more detail what just happened here. When you make the items.watch request, you have to specify a few things to Google. The first is a collection ID. This is an identifier that, um, that specifies exactly what collection you're listening to. Uh, think of this as the playlist ID. The second piece of information is that access token. As I mentioned earlier, at the end of the OAuth 2 flow, you'll get an access token. That's what you'll use in the authorization header. The third piece of information is the notification endpoint address. That's a URL where you're going to be receiving your notification running on one of the domains that you registered with your application. And finally, there is the universally unique identifier of the notification channel. This is unique for your web application. And your application is the one that has to specify it um, in order to make sure that, it's, that whenever you receive a notification, you'll be able to know in exactly which notification channel it's receiving notification for. So perhaps you have a lot of users. 
Uh, you'll want to know exactly which user this notification channel is associated with, and also which collection it's associated with. And maybe multiple users are sharing the same collection. So you really need something that's unique. Uh, the good news is that most programming languages provide a very simple way to get a uh, random uh, UUID, and Jeff will show you an example of that a little bit later. Finally, there's a channel token. This is for your needs. It's optional. You don't have to specify it. It's just to make it much easier for you to process the notification. Um, it's going to be something that's custom for your application. Maybe it helps the application know how to process the notification. Maybe it helps identify which is, what user this is. Um, there's a variety of things you can use it for, but it's available to you. So this is what the HTTP looks like. Now, if you're using one of our client libraries, you don't really need to know the HTTP protocol, but I still think it's useful for you to understand just conceptually what's going on. Uh, you're making a post request to a specific URL, it'll probably end with slash watch, and you're specifying the playlist ID and the query parameter. The authorization header is where you put that access token. So again, accessing the user's protected data, you've got to specify the access token. And because it's a post, there's a JSON body here, and you specify a few things. One is that we're using webhook and the notification URL. In this case, it's uh, slash notifications on my website. And I want to, uh, know, you to notice HTTPS. That's actually important. We want to make sure that these requests are made to a secure location. The ID, that's that unique identifier. That's a channel ID. And finally, there's a custom token. You can leave that out. It's your choice. Now, the watch response from Google um, will typically be a 200 OK, everything went fine, assuming you know, the authorization check worked. And it will give you a bunch of information. The key information I want you to highlight for you today is that expiration time. Now, this varies between different uh, Google APIs. You'll want to read their documentation to learn how it works. Um, th it is possible to set an infinite uh, channel expiration time, but typically it's a one hour expiration time. That's what YouTube has implemented. Um, and it'll come back to you, here's the H, what the HTTP response looks like. Um, some of this information, uh, such as the ID, is just giving you back what you sent Google. But, and there's some things like the resource ID and the resource URI, which I just don't have time to go into right now. But they might be of use to you. Um, but most important here is that expiration time. This is the number of milliseconds uh, of Unix time. So, you can look at that, too, to, and you, you maybe want to store that information, for example. I'll talk a little bit more about the end of a channel notif uh, notification channels a little bit later. So let's take a look at the sync notification. This is what we've built this for. We want to receive a notification the moment that you set up the notification channel. You'll get a couple pieces of information. The resource state here is sync. I'll show you the two other possible resource states in just a moment. Th there is that unique identifier. Again, that's helping you identify exactly which notification is associated with. And that optional channel token that might help you process the, uh, the notification. So here's what the HTTP request looks like. Again, this is Google calling your web application notification endpoint. Most of the information is in those headers. So one piece of information is the resource state. In this case, it's sync. There's a channel ID and channel token that I mentioned earlier, as well as some of the other pieces of information. And there's also a message number, which I won't have time to go into, but is sometimes useful, especially in error cases. And a successful notification response from your notification endpoint, it's just going to be 200 OK. There's really nothing more to it. I'll mention one um, neat trick that you can use a little bit later. But here's the HTTP, very simple. You don't really need to give it, no, Google anything. Just 200, OK. Uh, make sure it's 200 and not something else. <laughs> and I'll tell you why in a moment. <laughs> so here is a typical app, uh, scenario where you ha the user is using some client application. Maybe it's on their mobile device. Maybe it's somewhere else. Uh, that's not really important. And the, my point is it doesn't need to be your web application. It can be from anywhere. It's going to be making some change to the collection. It's going to be inserting a new item. It's going to call the item set insert method. And you can see that little animation, that new item popping up in your collection. And Google is going to then notify your notifications endpoint. The only thing that's different between a sync notification and this scenario is that the resource state will be exists. And again, it returns to 200. OK. So here's a little bit more detail about the exists notification. Resource state is exists. I mentioned that earlier. The channel ID, channel token. HTTP looks almost the same. 
The only thing that's really changed here, other than the message number, um, which increases every time, is the resource state. Now, you might be thinking, what do I do if I receive an exist? Is there any more information about exactly what just happened? Um, and that's not, I'm just displaying the basic protocol. Um, APIs have the option to give more information, such as the JSON metadata about that a new item that was inserted. It might be some a URL we can get more information. In the case of YouTube, there won't be such a, a, um, a JSON payload, but it's useful to know. Um, for example, the Google Cloud Storage API has chosen to use it. So here's a case where we've got an update going on, and it's a very similar scenario. We call it, it's called the, the client application is calling is um, items update, and the item got updated, and it's going to send. Google's going to send an exist notification, just like an insert. Okay, so the information is the same. Message number increased, the resource state is exists. So you might be thinking, how do I tell between an update and an insert? Well, we don't really have a way to tell, give you a difference. Again, that's going to be specific to the scenario that you, you're talking about. So Jeff will show an example of how he manages that in his demo uh, just a little bit later. Now what happens when you delete an item? It's very similar to an update. The item will now fly away, and Google will send a notification to the notification endpoint, not exist is the resource state. So those are the three possible states. A sync, which is sent exactly once at the beginning of a, a notification channel, and exist whenever an item got inserted or updated, or not exist when it got deleted. And here's some more details about it. Again, the resource state is not exists, and channel ID and channel token, and the HTTP protocol, just showing you everything's pretty similar, except the resource state is not exists and the message number increased again. So what do we do if the server is not reachable? This happens sometimes. Maybe the server is down. Uh, maybe there's some kind of problem. Uh, who knows what could go wrong? Um, you'll be, we'll give you some assurance that we'll make an attempt to, no, to still send that notification to you. So if, say it's a 503, some server error, Google will wait a little bit of time and then send you that notification again. If it's still an error, it will try, retry that notification um, up until some threshold. I don't remember exactly what it is. Maybe it's uh, 75 minutes. But whatever that threshold is, it will make an attempt until it receives an okay response. Now, that message number might be useful uh, because that message number will be the same every time it retries a notification. So you'll know, you'll be able to catch the case where there's duplicates. So finally, in the life of notification channel, how do we stop it? Well, one possibility is that the notification channel might expire uh, within an hour. Um, another possibility, if you actually want to manually stop notifications, uh, perhaps the user is no longer using the application. Um, one way to do that is in your notification endpoint, you, can, you still return a 200 OK, but you can add an additional header to tell it to stop. And this is what the HTTP protocol looks like, xgoog channel with a value of stop. And Google simply stops sending you notifications for that one specific notification channel for that one user with that one collection. It doesn't mean stop all notifications, period. Just that one channel. Now, the other option is um, if you're not in the notification endpoint, you can also uh, simply call the channels.stop method, where you have to specify exactly what is, again, that access token that you used earlier, as well as that channel ID to specify exactly which channel you want to stop receiving notifications from. That's pretty much it for the protocol. Um, that you will be able to get a lot more details um, in the documentation that we'll post later. Um, and this is what the HTTP um, request looks like when you stop a channel um, and you just have to spe specify the channel ID. But I'll hand it off at this point to Jeff to show you what this looks like in practice. Thanks, Yuniv. So we have a great infrastructure to build on top of, and I'm sure everybody out there has ideas for how they might want to use this. Uh, I wanted to demonstrate a sample application that I put together. Uh, this is going to be a Chrome extension that allows you to subscribe to a specific playlist and get notified when new videos are added to that YouTube playlist. Um, just a little caveat, um, we don't have the code available right now for folks to use, but we'll release this shortly. So let's pull that up. And I'm going to walk you through the entire flow of using it from loading the local extension. Over here, we have our YouTube playlist notifier. 
Uh, unfortunately, a little small over here in the corner of the screen. But um, the first thing that we need to do is we have this little question mark over here. And it just doesn't know which playlist we want to listen to. So let's create a new playlist. I'm going to use the Google API as Explorer to do that. And I have everything already pre-populated. And I'm going to click Execute down here. And this is going to use the YouTube API to create a new playlist for me. So that's great. I have my JSON resource that's returned. And the thing I care about is the ID of that new playlist. I'm going to copy it, go back to my application, and I can now paste that in. And click Save. And at this point, what I get presented with is the screen asking me for permission. So this is actually the OAuth2 flow that's built into Chrome. This is actually quite neat. Um, if you're doing JavaScript development, if you're running Chrome extensions, it makes it really easy to get OAuth2 tokens uh, for the currently uh, logged in user to Chrome. And it's just saying, you know, it wants to view my YouTube account. I'm going to click Allow. After I go through that, it's going to establish the connection. And behind the scenes, it's doing the watch. We're going to dive into the code in a little bit. But I just wanted to show off what this could actually do. Uh, I'm going to now add a video to the playlist that I'm watching. So I have, again, the API Explorer up. Most of these fields are already there. But let me put in the new playlist ID. And before I click Execute, just take a look in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. Um, that's where hopefully the magic will happen. Click Execute. And we have over here, um, right now, it's switched to one. So there is now one video that's available to watch. And if I click over here. You can see the new videos that are for the playlist. Right. Shameless plug for my IO talk from last year. Everybody, I'm sure, wants to watch that and be notified right away when that's added to a playlist. So um, this happened, you know, everything behind the scenes, more or less in real time. And um, wanted to dive in to how we actually built that. So a um, number of different components that went into this application. Uh, we have kind of the user-facing client, which is Chrome, Chrome extension. There is some middleware, which is the App Engine um, instance I have running. And that's what's going to take care of receiving the notifications and doing some of the API calls for us. And obviously, we have the YouTube API. Uh, this wouldn't be a YouTube talk without the YouTube API factoring in somewhere. So first things going on, we went through the OAuth2 flow. We have a access token for the current user. And I'm going to, in my Chrome extension, make a call to my App Engine instance saying, hey, I want you to kick off a watch. I'm going to pass in my OAuth2 token. And I'm going to also pass in the playlist ID that I want to start watching. And the App Engine instance will make a call to the YouTube API on my behalf. It'll call the playlistitems.watch method. Um, I'm actually going to be using the Python client library to do that. And we'll show you the real code in a second. And uh, at that point, once I get a successful response and once my um, push notification subscription is active, I'm going to open up a channel connection to Chrome uh, from my App Engine. So this is using the App Engine Channels API. And this is, provides a really easy way for App Engine to push things down to Chrome and to notify me when there's a new video. So that's um, the watch flow. And let's go through the actual Python code. Uh, that was used to create that watch flow. Um, again, Python client library makes this really easy. It's just a question once you have your YouTube object and it's already authenticated and all that, you call the watch method, pass in the playlist ID, uh, you pass in particle snippet. This is just your way of telling YouTube that you care about the general metadata about the new video that's been added to the playlist. And there's a body. And this corresponds directly to the body of the post request that Yaniv went over earlier. So this shouldn't be a surprise to anybody who saw the earlier portion of the code. Um, the, one, the two things I wanted to note, I am making use of that optional token, uh, channel token that Yaniv mentioned. And I'm, in this case, passing in the playlist ID as a channel token. And this is just the purposes of writing my application. I found it easier to use that value to store that state about which playlist I'm going to be watching. And that'll make it easier to get the state of the collection later on when I get notifications. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is that unique UUID. Uh, to generate that in Python, it's just a standard li library call to UUID 4. So pretty straightforward. And we now want to call execute so that request actually gets sent off. So I now have an active subscription. Uh, let's talk about what happens during the sync. So I received that initial sync back uh, saying, hey, you know, YouTube API tells App Engine immediately after the subscription, this is your chance to get state about the current collection. So that's great. Uh, my App Engine app is going to call playlist items list. You know, in this example, there wasn't any items in the playlist, so it's not super useful, but you can subscribe to an existing playlist. So you might imagine maybe there's five videos already in the playlist. You want to know about those five videos ahead of time in your application, and that's going to help you later on when you're processing the exists notifications. So we call a playlist items list, and what I'm going to do is just make use of a memcache instance within App Engine and store the, the list of current videos there. Um, I'm going to use the unique channel ID as a key. So this just lets me know what the kind of base starting state is. And now let's talk about what happens if starting exists. So again, YouTube API is contacting my app engine. It's you know, hitting a URL that I've defined during the registration. And it says that this isn't exists. So again, I'm going to call playlist items list. Uh, in this particular case, I'm going to make two different types of memcache calls. I want to first retrieve the previous state of the playlist, because uh, I'm going to be using that to calculate the delta and figure out what's changed. Uh, I also want to save the new state uh, within memcache, just so the next notification I get, I could go based on this state. So two different things going on, and we'll cover that soon. And uh, assuming something is new in the playlist, assuming the delta you know, didn't turn up empty, uh, I'm going to use the channel API to push down notification to Chrome, and then I end up using an iframe embed within Chrome to play back that video. So let's take a little bit of a dive into the code for that. Um, I'm getting the playlist ID from that xgoog channel token header, so I know which playlist I'm talking about when I get an incoming notification. And I'm just creating this empty set of initial videos. So I want to populate that with information about the current state of the playlist by making a YouTube.playlistitems.list call part of the Python client library. And I'm going to say part snippet, get some general metadata, and the most I could get at at one time is 50 videos. So max results equals 50. But we do have some ways of working around the fact that you know, there might be more than 50 videos in a playlist, and that's by looping through the request and using the nice native methods in the Python client library for paging through a set of results. So I'm going to end up going through a loop while the request is not, you know, is something that's true. I'm going to make the request. I'm going to take a look at each item in the request. I'm going to grab the video ID, put it in my set, and then I'm going to call list next, which is the way of handling paging in the Python client library. So this will keep going until we run out of items in the video. And now that I've retrieved the um, current state of the playlist, I want to get the channel ID, which I'm going to use from a memcache lookups. I get that from the request header. And I'm going to take two different actions depending upon whether this is a sync or whether this is an exists action. So if it happens to be a sync, what I'm going to be doing is just storing the current state of the playlist in memcache using the channel ID as a key. And if it's an exists, I want to do something slightly different. I'm going to look up the previous state. I'm going to then set the current state. And I'm going to make use of Python's nice set operations to calculate what's new in the current that wasn't in the previous. Assuming something is new, I'm going to basically make the appropriate Python app engine calls to use the channel API and tell Chrome, hey, something changed. So that's a walkthrough of how that uh, works. And hand things over to Yaniv to talk about the client libraries used. Great, Jeff. That's a really great example of uh, using the Python client library in action. And I just wanted to let you know I'm actually the leader of a, a team of engineers that develops uh, open source client libraries to make accessing Google APIs easy. And that was a demonstration of the Python client library. We actually also have um, Java and Objective-C supported, uh, including uh, Java including Android. And if you've seen the previous session here in this room on best practices for accessing uh, uh, YouTube on mobile devices, you've seen the Java and Objective-C client libraries in action. We actually have a variety of um, 
uh, open source client libraries as well um, that are in beta that we're developing for .NET, for JavaScript, for PHP. And just to make sure we try to capture as many languages on as many platforms as possible, we actually have um, in early stages of alpha development libraries in Go, Dart, Node.js, Ruby, and Google Web Toolkit. So I encourage you, if you're going to build this in practice, to use our client libraries, and that will automatically let you use the best practices. So we're going to move on to questions now. Thank you very much for attending. If you have questions, please go up to microphones. Yeah, I'll, I'll warn folks we have really bad push and pulling jokes that we're going to start talking about if people don't ask questions. So please <laughs> come up and spare everybody. So, so uh, actually, ahead. if you're interested in the slides, by the way, there's a link there where you can, um, they're actually publicly viewable. Um, and as well as uh, you want to follow us on Google Plus where you can get more information and follow-ups, such as uh, the um, sample that Jeff built. Yeah. Go right ahead. So I'm with the Machinima. We're a multi-channel network. Yes. Uh, can I get a push notification anytime somebody who's an affiliate uploads a video or changes content on their page, on their channel, sorry? Yeah, uh, so right now what we have built in time for Google I.O. is push notification support for playlist items. Uh, definitely video uploads, which would be like, you know, taking a look at playlist items for a specific video, for a specific ID, it would be like the uploads list. That is something that's very much on the radar. We when want to support a, when that When a soon. video is uploaded, it doesn't go into any default playlist, right? It's just uploaded. Yeah. Um, so we kind of treat it as if it were uploaded to a playlist with a special ID. Um, it, it's going to be supported not known shortly. Ahead, it's, not, it's not known ahead of time. It's, there's no like default playlist, quote unquote. It, it's a little strange, but we do treat it as if it were uploaded to a, a playlist that has a special ID. Um, so it, is, it, it will is, be possible to follow the same method to subscribe to new uploads. No, I mean, is that a known ID when you say mm -hmm. it's a default? Oh, so that every channel out there has a, that default ID. So like default ID, yes. ID zero is the ID where things are uploaded. Yeah, it's like channel.contentdetails.relatedplaylists.uploads. So right uploads. now, so, this, yes. so what you've just said would work to, for tracking new video uploads. The, this will work shortly for that scenario. Yes, not as of right now, but yes, it will soon. Oh, okay. Yeah, and okay. That's, that's a perfect use case. We want people to be able to do that. Right, okay, thanks. Yeah. Hey, guys. Um, that's actually really handy. Um, thanks. Uh, <laughs> what I want to know is um, when you send back the exists um, response or the exists post request, do you have plans to put in the delta or the current state of what you have rather than me going back out to get something from the API? Yeah. So it, it varies from API to API. Um, you need you know a little bit more about what cloud storage. Like if I is if I define right the resource type of yeah. what I'm uh, what I'm tracking. So to, you, to repeat the question, it's a great question. Um, do we have plans to add uh, more information when you do receive an exist notification? about exactly what has changed, the delta. Yeah. Um, that's actually a great question. So the Google Cloud Storage API actually does implement this. Okay. The JSON content includes a URL where you can literally receive um, a, a feed of what has changed for your, uh, for your ch notification channel. Um, so for YouTube APIs, I think what we're demonstrating today is not really going to be the final version. Yeah, um, yeah. I can't promise that there is going to be a JSON payload with the delta. Uh, it, it's an obvious case that it would be useful. Uh, we'll see what ends up being implemented. Cool. Yeah, we, we appreciate the feedback, and uh, yeah. we'll, we'll take that in, in in future development. We really think of this as a start. Yeah. Hi there. Um, so just to get a little bit of clarification on the guy from Machinima. So you can subscribe to events from other people that that aren't necessarily owned by your entity, right? So like, yeah. I could subscribe to your channel. Okay. Yeah. And so then you can. Is, so, is there a limit on how many things I can subscribe to, and is there going to be any sort of API quota stuff yeah. around that? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there will be. Uh, there are quotas associated with making that initial watch. I mean, if you compare the quota consumed by making a watch or refreshing a watch every hour because it does mm -hmm. expire after an hour versus pulling every minute, you're going to come out ahead by doing this. Uh, and just so, just to, to clarify that larger question, so it does ask me for. All two credentials before I could create a subscription, but I do not necessarily need to subscribe to something that I own. So the OAuth two credentials identify 
me, but I might want to subscribe to the, play, to the uploads for Google developers or playlists like Google Developer Zone or any other channel that's out there. Um, that is possible. That's supported. Yeah, thank so, you. Uh, there, there's actually one important point with, that we didn't have time to go into, which is if you were subscribing, uh, sorry, if you're watching for changes in a playlist that's public, that's not actually um, uh, only accessible by a single user, um, you don't necessarily need to ask for consent from the user, but the way that you do that is uh, a bit complex, and we, but we'll be able to follow up with you later if you're just in that. Yeah. And just to clarify, this isn't for comments or any other data aside from video playlists? So this is built on top of um, the YouTube a Data API version 3, and what we're talking about with YouTube. Obviously, there are other APIs out there. Uh, so kind of what's fair game to eventually support this is anything that the YouTube Data API v3 supports. Uh, we can't commit right now to every single type of collection will support it, but things like you know, up the uploads playlist, that's obvious. Um, I'm really hoping that we'll soon have support for the activities um, or your subscriptions when a new video is uploaded to that, into a channel you subscribe to, that sort of thing. Um, you know, right now there isn't actually support for comments in version three of the data API, so you can't really um, offer any push notifications there. And, and what's the timeline on what we just saw today versus what's gonna come down in the future? Uh, I don't have a specific timeline. I, um, yeah, it, it should be fairly soon. We scrambled a little bit to get some working demos for Google I.O., and we're really close. Um, a couple of remaining engineering things that need to be taken care of. So, you know, we'll post on our Plus YouTube dev um, Google Plus page when things are available, and we'll make those resources. We'll make it known. We'll push things out to you. You do not need to pull us. Basically, don't pull us. Don't email us every day. Um, we'll in, let you know. In terms of timeline, I just wanted to make one other note, which is the Google Cloud Storage API has already released availability for push notifications with their API. And the other point is I mentioned registering the a domain where you receive notification endpoints that hasn't launched yet, but will very soon. And we want to tell you about it because it become a requirement. So you're not surprised by that when it comes up. Hey, this isn't necessarily uh, directed towards push notifications, but is there, uh, are you guys planning to add uh, common functionality to the V3 API for YouTube? Uh, there's not really anything about that that I can announce okay. right now. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> so I think I have a little bit of a silly question, but you said this Sorry. current push notification system is built on the YouTube data API. Uh, is there any chance that it'll eventually be supported in the YouTube Analytics API? For, for uh, like changes in uploads, or you know, number of views, et cetera, <laughs> and so forth? So off camera, we have Christoph, who is the lead engineer for the Analytics API. Um, I don't know, Christoph, what do you say? <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes, pull Christoph every, <laughs> every few hours asking him whether it's ready. Um, but you know, the, the a uh, more serious response to that is that the YouTube Analytics API is built on top of this common Google API infrastructure, things like cloud storage. So they all use the same client libraries. Um, you know, this push notification support was added on the Google API infrastructure layer. So theoretically, um, as more and more APIs support it, you know, you'll be able to get this benefit from uh, all sorts of different services. Yeah, I, I love the question. I, I want, I'm, I'm happy to hear um, enthusiasm about it. Um, adding more functionality that uses yeah. the push notifications. Yeah. Similar idea, but with live events, especially like the start of a live event, would be great to kind of get notifications. I don't know if you can I, I'm sorry, you. oh, for live events? <clears throat> yeah, um, that's again, falls into the same bucket of things that theoretically should be done, so it's just a question of making sure that the right folks can prioritize that highly enough, so yeah. Um, looks like we're done with live questions. We're about out of time, so thanks so much, everybody. And uh, please rate our session, uh, yeah. especially if you liked it. There's a code over there you can use <laughs> or you, on your you mobile didn't. device. Even if you didn't like it, we, we appreciate we all the We want your feedback, feedback. Yes. absolutely. <laughs> if you didn't like it, let us know. Yes. Yes. Thanks, everybody.